Okay, I'll backtrack. Uh, uh, Galatians 5.22, uh, Paul's talking about uh, agape when he's speaking about love. And, and what I wanted to do with this class is I wanted to um, get into Galatians 5.22 every week, kind of take a look at the Greek word that's used, sort of define it, maybe look at it in context with other biblical passages, and then, and then go to a specific place in the Bible where that word is used and, and kind of dive into that. At least that's, that's the plan for, for what I was wanting to do. And so what Paul does here when he's talking about agape uh, is, is, is he's using this specific Greek word. Now, Strong's defines agape as love, benevolence, goodwill, and esteem. Agape was traditionally... Um, a little bit of history on the word of all the Greek words for love agape was the one that they didn't really know what to do with uh, it was sort of formless and voidless and colorless it was just a very broad general expression for love but in the New Testament the Holy Spirit has taken that word and given it a deeper richer fuller meaning that now is used to define love that only God can give and love that we're supposed to reflect from God um, so it, it, it definitely has a different sort of, of definition to it now. Now, in our culture, in, in the United States of America, we have all kinds of definitions of love. And, and of course, you can't bring up our culture and you can't bring up the word love without, of course, talking about the groups that are trying to redefine it, say that you can't, you know, it's not concrete, it's subjective, you can't really, you know, say that one thing is true about it at all. In fact, there's nothing true about love in any way, shape, or form. It's whatever you think or feel. And... As we go through some of these things, uh, some of these things that we talk about in relation to love, we can probably make a, a relationship to here, uh, and other things not so much. And this one, I would say the Bible definitely thwarts and, and, and stumps and, uh, and debunks. But we use love in all kinds of contexts, don't we? We say, man, I love those fries. That restaurant has the best food. I love that food. It is, it is, it is you know the best food ever. I love it so much, right? We use it and I, I love that song, right? You hear people all the time. Oh, I love that song. Turn that up. And of course, in my case, I'm like, I love that song. And so I was just like, turn that down. It's too loud. So, and she's laughing because it's true. <laughs> you know, but we use it in that sense, right? We use it in, a, in the sense that we love our toys. And I don't care who you are, you're, whether you're a man or a woman, if you're an adult, you have a toy and you love your toys, right? We love our toys. You have a hobby. Everybody has a hobby. I don't, know, I don't know anybody that doesn't have a hobby to some degree. We love our hobbies, right? We love that stuff. We use it in the sense of we love our TV shows. As Americans, we love our TV shows. Because I'm telling you, I have seen full-grown adults get depressed and cry after a TV series is over. I watched all the episodes? What am I going to do now? How is this... How am I going to find fulfillment? How is this going to happen? Or they cancel. The worst is when they cancel a show and they leave you on a cliffhanger. Like, you know, next season, I'm going to find out what happened to this guy with this situation. And then all of a sudden, Netflix is like, oh, sorry, we pulled the plug on that. And you're like, you've got to be kidding me. And you're furiously looking to see if someone else is going to pick it up. And nobody does, of course, you know, or, or if they do, it's, it's just not the same. We love our TV shows. So we use love in that sense. We use love in a very general sense, a very broad sense. We use it sarcastically also, right? I just love standing in line. It's just the best. I love being put on hold. I love having to pay taxes, right? We've all used it sarcastically in that sense. We, we, we use love in, in, in that very general sense like that. We also say in the sense about each other, I love you, bro, or I love you, you know, we hug one another, and, you know, I love this guy. Very general in that sense. We, we use love in a, uh, in a very gen general way. Uh, we also use love about our pets. And I believe we generally do love our pets, right? Because they're so cute. You just want to pick them up and just cuddle their little faces. And, you know, but people do. I mean, I mean you see people who lose a pet. Um, I've seen people lose a goldfish and get depressed, right? We, we love our pets. They're, they become a part of our family. And if it's a, a dog or a cat that's been with you for years and it's in all your family photos and you, you took it on vacation and, and, and it's wearing a sombrero hat and sunglasses and, you know, all that, you know, you know the kind of stuff that, that, that we all do with our pets. You love them. They're, they're, they're a part of your family. Love is also something that we feel towards our families, towards our children, towards, towards um, you know, the, the, the people in our lives, right? But love is also something that we're told can be broken, it can be lost, it can be misplaced. And you hear people use it in that sense. Oh, I just, you know, I put my love in the wrong place. Or 
Uh, it just wasn't meant to be. My, you know, my, my, my love is lost or my heart is broken. I mean, we hear that all the time, right? Love, love is misplaced. Love is mislost or, or you know, love is lost. And of course, we also talk about love in the sense that we love one another. You know, we love our spouse. So there is a whole slew of ways that we use love. Now, in Greek, if you think we, we, we use one word for all of it. In Greek, they had four words, at least four words for love. And so if you imagine the context that we always try to use it in and break it down and imagine the context that they used it in and tried to break it down. And of course, God takes this concept of love and he does something amazing with it. And not only that, he does something profound with it that no other religion has ever done with it, that, that no other theology has ever done with the concept of love. He does something that baffles your mind, it tears open your heart, and it changes you from, it changes a person from the inside out. Because in almost every other religion, practically, love is something where, where I, I, I think God loves me. I hope God loves me. I, I hope he's there. And I'm working really hard to try to, to be the best person that I can be. So that at the end of my life, when I'm standing before the pearly gates, I've done enough that I can get in. See, to a lot of people, that's love. To a lot of people, that's religion. To a lot of people, that's God's love. But the gospel changes all that. Because God brings in the gospel and he says, no, no, no. No, it's not that you've earned my love. It's not that you deserve it. It's that I know that you're broken as human beings, as the human race, and yet I love you anyway. I know that you've sinned and you've fallen, and yet I'm dying for you anyway. I know that you've rebelled and rejected me, and yet I'm still seeking you. This is, this is where love, in, in terms of what it means in the Bible, is so radically different. This is where it becomes something that, that, that doesn't just change the way you think. It changes you from the inside out. It changes you here first before it affects how you uh, interact with other people and see other people. And, of course, we see this in John 3.16. For God so loved, and that, that's where the word agape is used. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This agape love is an extension of God's grace and his mercy, his, his, his goodness, his kindness. All these things are an extension of him through agape love towards us. Now, again, agape uh, is used 116 times in the New Testament. And Bill Mounts writes this about love. He says, love in the New Testament usually... Is the active uh, when, when, when we're talking about it in the New Testament, it's usually for the active love of God for His Son and His people. The active love of His people are to have for God, so it's the love He gives us, and then in return, it's the love that we're supposed to give back to Him and to each other and even our enemies. You remember in Matthew five forty four, Jesus says, "Love your enemies, pray for those who, who spitefully use you and, and try to abuse you." You know, so it's it's uh, and it's even talked about in terms of the Lord's Supper. The, the common fellowship meal or the common meal shared by Christians in connection with church meetings. And that goes back to early manuscripts, early church fathers uh, for, for, for some of those definitions. Now, I, I kind of alluded to it, but what are these Greek words that we have for love? Well, here we go. So first and foremost, you have agape. and We've already kind of talked about agape, but then you have phileo. And of course, everybody points out that's what the city of Philadelphia is named after, uh, the city of, uh, of, of uh, brotherly love. Phileo was the general verb for love. Now, before agape became what agape was, phileo was kind of the catch-all word for love. It's what our word love sort of meant. It, was, it sort of encompassed everything. And, and it has a wide range of meanings. It can mean hospitality, affection, love, even to kiss. And it's not necessarily even a softened or watered down form of love. Like sometimes you hear, well, it can only mean brotherly love. And that's sort of where we box it in that. It can only mean that. But it's used also of God's love for his son and our love for God. So uh, an example is um, John 5, 20. The father loves the son and the son shows him all he does. The word that's used there for love is phileo. And then um, Paul warns the, the church in Corinth, if anyone does not love phileo, the Lord, a curse be on him. And of course, Jesus phileo loved Lazarus. So there is a very general broad sense in which uh, phileo can be used. The other words that you have are eros. And eros means romantic or sensual love between a man and a woman. It means to feel passionately about, to have a longing for, or to feel fervently about. So it's, it's, it's the romantic love uh, that, that we can feel about our spouse. Uh, and it, ironically, it does not occur in the New Testament. 
It's a Greek word that, that never made it into the New Testament whenever love was used. You also have stergo, and this is used for a person's affections for others. So that I love you, bro, kind of thing. You know, you, you know the, the high five hug thing that we've sort of adopted in our culture. That's stergo. You know, we're, we're, you know if, if me and Lance do that for, you know, to one another, we're, we're expressing stergo, right? So now I'm not going to yell stergo if I high five you or anything like that. But, but it's used for affection for others. Uh, and, and it can be used uh, in terms of what a person used for their God and, and little G God. Uh, or even their dog. I mean, it covers the whole broad spectrum of how we feel. Uh, and also, it does not occur in the New Testament, but it is there in compound form. So uh, in idea form, in, in sort of uh, implied form. So that's really your four basic Greek words for love. And where we, where we really see it in action is in John 21, verses 15 through 17. Jesus has risen from the grave. He's, he's appeared to the apostles. He's at the seaside with Peter. And he has that famous conversation with Peter, where Peter has denied him three times. You know, I don't know him. I don't know the man. And he starts cursing. I'm telling you, I've never met this man before in my life. I don't even know his name or who he is. So Jesus appears to him. And Jesus, as he's talking to Peter, he, he's asking him, do you love me with agape? And Peter's answering, I love you with phileo. Now, this is where I actually disagree with, with Bill Mounts. I'm not a Greek... Um, what, scholar by any means whatsoever. Uh, I know just enough to get myself in trouble and to pass whatever classes I had to take at Fried Hardeman. Um, but he says because phileo is such an open and such a broad definition that really it's not, it's not that there's a difference between Jesus using agape and that Peter's using phileo. It's that it's all just stylistic. And I disagree with that. I think there are certainly some cases where it can be stylistic, but it is significant that Jesus is specifically using one form of love and Peter's answering with another form of love. And, and, and what makes it even more significant is that Jesus purposefully switches to phileo love. So in the first case, it appears he's saying, do you agape? Do you, do you love me, Peter, the way that I love you? Now, Peter, what we know about Peter throughout his life and throughout his ministry is he kind of stuck his foot in his mouth. You know, when, when, he, when, when Jesus first appeared to him in the boat at the beginning of his ministry, he cowered before Jesus. You know, you make me feel weak and small. You know, you make me feel sinful. Get, you know, get away from me. And, and you know, Peter would, Peter would often make these great statements of faith. You know, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then he would, he would get into arguments about who was the greatest in the kingdom. Uh, he would just, you know, I can relate to Peter a lot. <laughs> I really can. But he's asking him, do you love me? And he's saying, yes, I love you. Okay, Peter, do you agape love me? Yes, of course I love you. You know I love you. Well, tend my sheep, feed my lambs. Peter, do you phileo love me? Do you even love me in the general sense? Are we even friends, Peter? Do you, do, do you love me? In the basic way that we understand love. And again, this is grieving Peter. Of course, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. And so you see where, where, where the impact of these two words come in. Because if, if Jesus is really using agape and Peter is using phileo, uh, it kind of shows you that there might actually be some, some, some teaching going on here from Jesus. Do you love me like I love you, Peter? I mean, isn't that a question that we all need to be asked? Do I love him the way he loves me? Do I serve him the way he serves me? Do I even care about him like he cares about me? And, and, and these are questions that we should all wrestle with from time to time. So a, a very powerful example of where this is used and how this is used. So before we dive into our actual text here, um, any questions or thoughts on this? If there are, you can jump in at any time. No, no problem there. Okay, so... Paul shows us, though, what agape love looks like in our everyday lives. And there is a verse, well, really a chapter that we go to in the New Testament. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 7. If I speak in tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. I have prophetic powers, and if I have prophetic powers and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have and I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not 
insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoings, but rejoices with truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And now usually when you hear this read, you expect to look up and see the, the bridesmaids and the groomsmen. and, 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 and be Because this is often read at weddings, right? And I think, that, I think it's very appropriate to read at weddings. It's a very... Um, all, all these things about love should absolutely be true in a marriage. And yet this verse is so incredibly simple that we can look at it and say, yeah, I understand exactly what it's saying. And yet it's so, it's so profound that when you get in it and you see what Paul is really trying to drive home to the church in Corinth, it can change everything you think about love, at least about agape love. See, Paul is showing us that the Holy Spirit working in our lives is not the same as merely living a busy life in service of others. It's, it's not even the same thing as a morally committed life. There's a lot of people out there, again, thinking you know, about, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a good moral person. I hope that's good enough to get to heaven. Well, Paul's saying, no, it's not, because you, know, you can never be moral enough or good enough. The Holy Spirit working and shaping love in your life means that you have to first meet love as a powerful action, and then you have to meet love as a person. And that's what Paul's really driving at. And I'll show you what all that means here as, as we're going along. But if you take a look at verses 1 and 2, Paul's making this list of, of all these miraculous gifts that the church in Corinth has. He says you can speak in tongues, you can prophesy, you can understand all mysteries. And that's a gift in teaching the word of God, understanding the words that can be taught. You have faith that can move mountains. Uh, this is visionary faith that inspires people. These are gifts of the Spirit. And he's saying you have these gifts. And you're using these gifts at the church in Corinth. And it's filled with all these talented people who had these amazing gifts. I mean, it's an incredible church. And Corinth was not, really, it was a lot like our big American cities today. It was an urban center. It was a financial center. It was a trading center. It, it was a place where highly educated people went. You went to a place like Corinth to get a better life, to find yourself, to make a, to make a name for yourself. It's a place where people came to excel. A lot like Columbus, Ohio, a lot like uh, Cincinnati or Cleveland, or um, I'll include Pittsburgh in that, I guess. You know, any, any city you want to think of, Houston, Dallas, whatever it is. And the church in Corinth, honestly, may mirror, uh, maybe the closest to mirroring, mirroring the modern big American church, the big city American church, right? Maybe with the exception of a place like Ephesus. Uh, Ephesus is also a big city. It's also an urban center. It's also a hub. And... So you've got this unique situation where you've got all these, all these people in the church that have come out of, of the, the secular life of what this city was. And they're using their spiritual gifts in a way that Paul's saying, that this isn't good. It's not right what you're doing. It's not right uh, how, how you're practicing that. And Paul is saying, Fon got really small on that. Paul's saying that it's possible to have these amazing gifts and yet at the same time use them without love. It's possible to, to, have, to have gifts of the Holy Spirit and use them in a way that is not loving. And how is this possible? Because if you, it's possible because if you look ahead to verses 4 through 7, Paul is listing in verses 4 through 7 and everything leading up to 1 Corinthians 13, all the problems you see, he's listing all the things that the, that the uh, Christians in Corinth are not. These are all the things that you are not doing, despite having the Holy Spirit, despite having these gifts, despite uh, having all these talents. You're not what God needs you to be. You're not patient. You're not long-suffering. You're not kind. You're not selfless. You're not without boasting. I mean, we see, we see all sorts of problems as he's going through, even, even as early as chapter 1, the problems that are going on among the brethren in Corinth. They're gifted. They're talented. They're successful. They're serving others. But their character and their attitudes, he says, are not loving. You can, you can do all these great things, all these amazing things. Do, be, be involved in all these incredible opportunities and in, in things in life. And if you're not loving, if you're not doing it because of love, then it means nothing. They're cranky. They're divided. And, and one of the things you get the impression that they're doing is they're always trying to out-gift or out-Christian one another. You ever seen people that try to out-Christian one another? You know, it's, it's, it, it, it's almost laughable, but it comes back to the same problem that we're having in Corinth. In America, what really counts, right? Are you smart? Are you, can you produce? Are you the best at what you do? Are you the fastest? Are you the strongest? Maybe you have character flaws, but you know what? Those character flaws really should just be celebrated because that's what makes you unique and that's what makes you interesting. Uh, there's an author, an American author, by the name of Norman Mailer. Wrote a lot of our classic literature from uh, going back to the 1930s all the way up through the 1970s. He wrote books about... Uh, 
World War II. He wrote books about uh, Muhammad Ali, Marilyn, uh, Marilyn Monroe. I almost said Marilyn Manson. <laughs> Marilyn Monroe. And yeah, sure, he was you know, prone to temper tantrums. And yeah, okay, maybe he stabbed one of his wives with a knife in a fit of rage once. Who cares? That makes him unique. He has, he has character, right? And that's, that's kind of what you see going on even in our culture. It's, it's, it's often what people like Norman Mailer and people like him get as a pass because they're brilliant and because they have all these talents or because they can, they can throw a football farther than anybody or because they're, they're, a, a, you know, they're in politics. You know? So the rules don't really count for these folks. And what Paul is saying is he's saying, no, it's not like that. It's the other way around. If you're brilliant, if you're gifted, if you're talented, if you're using your talents, in God's service, but you're filled with pride or anger or boasting, then you're nothing. You're nothing at all. It's of no service to God at all. And you notice, um, often he talks about this, this clang, these clanging cymbals and these banging gongs. One of the ways that people worship their pagan gods in the city of Corinth uh, and, and all across the pagan world was through banging cymbals, beating drums, uh, you know, ch uh, you know, chiming the cymbals and things. And what they were doing was they're trying to show how excited and how full of zeal that they were for their God. How, you know, and, and it was to get everybody to see, look, look, how, look how, how pleasing I am to my God. Look how much I love my God. Look, how, look how, how fervently I worship my God. And Paul even talks about it in Romans, you know, about, about Jews who are full of zeal, but, they, but they, don't, you know, they don't have truth. And it's the same thing here. It's supposed to show that you're excited, that you're full of zeal. And Paul tells the church that if you use these gifts given to you by the Holy Spirit in the manner in which you're currently using them, then you're just as empty and just as meaningless as those gongs and cymbals that are banging out there sounding for a God that doesn't exist. It's just as meaningless as that. It's just as pointless as that. It's just as wrong as that. And he's, Paul is really getting into some deep stuff, some scary stuff really if you think about it. And so everyone gets to see and hear what you're doing, but it's all in vain. If love is not the reason you're doing it, then it's all in vain. Now, Paul had just set out these nine things to the church in Galatia. Love, joy, peace, kindness, uh, patience, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. I got, I got, I got to sing the song. <laughs> gentleness and self-control. And if this, if this list is just a list that we're just supposed to pick up and do, we would be just like the church in Corinth. Well, what's our motivation? If it's just something we're supposed to do, what's our motivation to do it? What motivates us if it's just a list of do this, don't do that? Paul, though, is demonstrating that love is not just something that we merely do. It's a power that has to first pick you up and change you. And again, when we read that it's patient, that it's kind, it does not envy, it doesn't boast, it's not arrogant, it's not rude, it doesn't insist on its own way, it's not irritable, it's not resentful, it doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing, it bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things. Why can he write that? How can he say that, that, that we as Christians are supposed to have that? And the reason is because you learn to love first by being loved. You think about it. A newborn baby, what can a newborn baby do to show you love? It can't do anything, can it? It can cry when it's hungry. It can, it can cry when it needs its diaper changed. It can cry when it's sleepy. But a newborn baby is not going to know how to love unless it is first love. And all sorts of studies have been done um, over the years about, about how a baby needs love. If you don't pick up a baby or kiss a baby or hold a baby or coo to a baby or sing to it or cuddle it, it, it can actually die. And if not death, then it's going to grow up warped because it's not going to have a sense of what it means to be loved. And it, that baby will never grow up and learn to love unless it's getting that right there. You know, rubbing its head, holding it close to you so it can hear your heartbeat, kissing it. You know, all the things that we do. And yes, men can do this too. Absolutely you can. It doesn't make you, it doesn't make you weak or wimpy. <laughs> and that's, that, that's the thing of it, right? The more we are loved the more we can reflect love. And if we can see that on, on the level of an infant, can we not see it on the level of agape? You can't love in, in an agape way unless you first have experienced it, unless you first have seen it, unless it's first been given to you. And many of us experience that through our parents, through our friends, through our spouses, uh, through, through all sorts of means. It, it, it's why we do things here like church camp. It's why we do things like vacation Bible school. It's why we have gospel meetings. It's why we have fellowships 
trying to pull people in because we want to love them, because we want to show them what this is like. And the more we're embraced, the more we're surrounded, the more we're flooded by love as we grow up, the more we're capable of doing it. And that's both true physically and spiritually. You can't love unless you are first yourself loved. Because before love is something that you try to do, it's something you meet and receive. I just, this is one of those times where I wish they had wrote the chapter something the way they did. I know. Because if you go back to the last verse of chapter 12, after you spent all this time talking about gifts and spiritual gifts, the last line is, but now I want to point out the way of life that the grateful that he died for. Yeah. So that, that should almost be the first part of chapter 11. I 100% agree. So it's a way of life. You can't get to a way of life until you get it. That's absolutely right. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. Chapter twelve, it, and again, it, it it shows you it shows you just how how one piece these actual letters were. I mean, the, the, if you know Paul didn't write the the, you know, the chapters and the verses into his own letters, that's an excellent point. It's it's you know, agape love is something you first have to receive before it can change you, um, and, and and it's a life as was pointed out. Now to have love as a fruit of the spirit. We need to receive this agape love, which is infinitely greater and infinitely higher than the love that anything or anyone can give us. And that doesn't downplay the love that our parents give us or that our spouses give us or that we give our children. But, but agape love in the biblical sense is higher than all of that. Paul personifies love to get across the idea that it's a power. And, and it certainly is, right? But then he does something else. He does a second thing. He personifies love to get you to think of a person. And that's, this is where this, is where this really gets driven home. He's trying to get you to think of it in terms of what it is for you and then who you've seen it in. Now, I'm probably putting the cart before the horse, but you probably have a pretty good idea of who, he, of who we've seen it in. If verses 4 through 7, again, are just an abstract model of what a perfectly loving person needs to be in their life, if it's just a model of how to be a perfectly loving person, I don't want that. And I'm going to bet you don't want it either. You want to know why? Because you're going to sit there and you're going to look at this. And, and, and if it's just a list of do this, don't do that, you're going to look at it and you're going to go, I can't do that. I can't be that. Not perfectly. Not, not, not in the way I need to be. I, I can't be like that. And if, and if you approach the Bible with the understanding that I have to live up to what, to what Jesus did, it's going to crush you. And the thing about Christ is that he never asks us to live up to him. He asks us to live for him. That's what, that's what makes Christianity so approachable, too, is, you know, the, the idea that you are a human and you're going to mess up is all baked into the cake there. And so what he's telling us is, is that these are things you have to strive to be. These are things you have to want to be. These are things you have to see in somebody else. And so Paul's not just giving you a list of do this, don't do that. For Paul to personify love but not see that he has a particular person in mind is to miss the entire point. So consider this. That when Paul says, when he writes that love suffers long, consider that maybe he has somebody specific in mind. How could he not have, have had in mind the one who cried out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The one who hung there with nails driven through his hands and his feet, bleeding, suffering, and crying out, where are you, God? The one who in the garden hours before said, God, if it be possible, let this cup pass for me, not as I will, but as you will. Or consider that when Paul writes that love does not keep a record of wrongs, that what he's doing is, is, is thinking of, about the one who said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Remember, he's on the cross. He's hanging there. People have stripped him all but naked. They're gambling for his clothes at his feet. His, his own mother is standing there watching him die. People are, people are, are, are casting all sorts of, of, of criticism at him. Oh, he's the son of God, right? He saved all these people. Let's see him save himself. Come on, Jesus, get down off that cross. They've beaten him. They've scourged him. They've whipped him. They've humiliated him. He's been abandoned. He's been forsaken. He's, been, he, he, he's had everything taken from him. How could a human being be treated any worse? And he says, God, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Speaking of things he said on the cross, one of the most amazing things he said on the cross was, it is finished. Now, if you think about that, it's pretty unique because he's naked, abandoned, forsaken, denied, betrayed. He's penniless, he's powerless, he's tortured, he's beaten. And in the final moments of his execution, 
as he's about to die, he says, I did it. Now, what did he do? Because by, ob- uh, by all objective standards from a worldly perspective, he was a miserable failure. Right? He couldn't do the things he set out to do. He couldn't save everybody. He couldn't establish the church while he was here on earth. And he was ultimately martyred. Right? But yet, by what he did from God's perspective, he was triumphant. And what he's doing, in other words, he refused to die until he accomplished everything he came to do. And what he came to do was saving you and me. That's what he came to do. Love never fails. Who could you ever in your life say that about in that context? That love never fails. As much as I love my friends, as much as I love my family, as much as I love my children, as much as I love my wife, one day my love's going to fail. I'm going to die. I'll be gone. I can't give it anymore at that point. I can leave a legacy behind, hopefully a good one. But who could you ever truly say that about? That their love will never fail. Even, even as a human being, my love fails because I'm imperfect. Who could you say that about? Well, there's only one person you can say that about. So when you look at verses 4 through 7, you see Jesus Christ being all these things, right? Being the ultimate example of those things on the cross. Being the ultimate example of everything that Paul is talking about in these fruits of the Spirit. Being the ultimate example of everything that he's going through in 1 Corinthians 13. Doing all of that, not just as an example for you, but being in your place as well. This will absolutely, it, it really it does two things what Paul is doing. First, he's squashing all of your fears. Jesus squashes every bit of fear you have, or at least makes them feel so trivial. Yeah, life is hard. Life is difficult. Things are tough. But if I'm in Christ, no matter what happens, I have a home in heaven, and I'm loved more than I could ever possibly believe because he values you enough to die for you. The creator, sustainer, redeemer, of all creation loved you enough to come here and die in your place. The second thing it does is it humbles you into the dust because he loves you despite everything you are. You're not perfect. You're temperamental. You're, and I'm talking about me too, not just you. <laughs> right? We're all these things. And despite our flaws, he loves us anyway. And yet, in John 17, 20 through 21, Jesus prays, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe it through their word, but that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Now, that's about all I've got for today. I wanted, I wanted to leave some time at the end for, for conversation or for questions uh, or for discussion. Uh, what do you think? Agape love. How is it? How is it something in our lives that we can mirror? How is it something that we need to perfect? Can we perfect it? What do you think? (laughs) So uh, if there's nothing else, uh, we'll bow for a word of prayer and and, and then we'll be done. Father, we thank you for allowing us to be here. Thank you so much for your son. Thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to, to talk about your word as brothers and sisters in Christ, to study it. We thank you, God, for everything that you've given us through Christ. We know that that you love us. We know that you care for us. And we just pray, Father, that we exhibit that love in our own lives to our, to our friends and our families and, and, and to those in our community. And, and help us, Father, not to be discouraged in those times when, when we don't feel like uh, we're doing everything that we can be or, or, or that we're not feeling as strong as we should be. Help, Father, to lift us up and give us strength. Please watch over us and forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all.